All right, thanks. Um, I'm going to be talking about shape as an organizing principle for data. And um, uh, yeah. OK, so what's the problem we're trying to solve? It's data complexity. So data complexity comes to us, us as data scientists, in lots of forms. One is data volume. Uh, it comes just large volumes of data. But the kind of complexity that, that interests me a little bit more is complexity in the feature space. So this is when you have a lot of features. And more importantly, there are interactions between features. So think here of uh, gene expression information, where you don't just have information about how individual genes are acting in the human body, but those genes, how they're expressing, are related to each other. Another example of complexity might be when you walk into a room full of people, such as this one, and everyone's talking, it sounds like white noise, right? And if you want to understand what's being said in the room, you need to filter through that white noise. And that white noise complexity can come across just as, as meaningless information. So our goal is to, is to summarize what's happening. And I mean that in a, in a kind of, in a very technical sense. Um, and the way, the way I'm proposing to do it is to summarize by using shape, to use the shape of the data to summarize what's happening and get a handle on complexity. So this is, this is what the talk is about, shape as an organizing principle for data. Now, this is something that actually all of you do already, but maybe you haven't quite thought of it in these terms. So here's a, here are four examples. In the upper left, there's, you, you have your data, you plot it out, and you see that it looks like a line. A line is a kind of shape, right? As soon as you know it's a line, there's all sorts of techniques that you can apply, right? You can use linear regression. Your data becomes predictive, right? It becomes useful for you all of a sudden. And that, that was because you knew that the data had the shape of a line. If all data had just one shape, if everything was lines, we'd be done. Um, going down below, you see an example where you have clustering, right? The data breaks into distinct pieces. Now, how many pieces something breaks into is kind of, it's really the most basic property a shape can have. So again, once you know something about the shape, you can apply clustering techniques and get some result, right? Cluster A, cluster B, et cetera. Well, if, if everything were lines or clusters, again, we'd be done. But, but we're not, right? There's also circles, right? This is, if you plot out your data and you see a circle, maybe you, you have periodic behavior. Once you see that, right, when you, there's a whole wealth of other techniques that you're going to apply to this situation. Uh, maybe Fourier series or something, a little bit a more modern way of understanding signal processing. Um, but it relied on seeing, again, you saw that it was a circle. Or maybe you had a hypothesis that there was periodic behavior. Um, so maybe now you, you, you're pretty close to done. You have regression, right, the lines. You have classification, the clusters. You have periodic behavior. Well, here's another shape that we see a lot, the Y junction. This is, shares some things in common with the line. There's continuous variation along some direction. But it also shares some things in common with clustering. There are kind of three different kinds of behaviors. Maybe you want to think of this as as you move out on one of these flares, some, something gets more extreme. Maybe you have like normal population in one group and then type 1 and type 2 diabetes in the other two groups. Now, once you saw what the data was, you were able to choose an appropriate model, right? The problem is, in, data, in big data problems and complicated data problems, and the kind of data problems we deal with, not only can you not plot the data because of its dimensionality, but you actually don't know what the right hypothesis is for what the shape of the data is, for what the right model to apply is. You guess and you try, but even when you do that, it can be hard to know that you've made a poor guess. So by using um, shape, as a way to understand what's happening in, in the data before you do your modeling, you're going to be able to better apply your models, choose better models. You're going to understand more about your data. So the way, 
I'm proposing to do that is to use topology or topological data analysis, also called TDA. It's a way of producing shape summaries, right? It's a way of summarizing aspects of your data before you start a problem so that you can, so you can see what you have. And you want to do this with as few assumptions as possible. So in particular, the methods that I'm going to describe, there's no manifold assumption if you know what that means. There's no smoothness assumption. There's no underlying assumption about uh, statistical generating process. All there is is a notion of similarity or distance. That's all that's required in order to summarize and understand shape. Now, that itself is a kind of hypothesis. It's something that's built into the problem if you choose a metric or in your feature engineering process. So it's not that we get rid of all hypotheses, but we try and limit them as much as possible. Any other method that you're going to use is going to take a distance or similarity and then do additional things, add additional hypotheses in. We, the philosophy here is to stop at that stage. Once you've done that, you've already organized the data. It already has shape, so you might as well know what it is. Okay, so I'm going to go a little bit fast here for how these topological summaries are generated. And there's sort of a wealth of literature that, that you can go to online and find out more information. So the way we're going to generate a summary is respect, with respect to a function. So this is, this is a lot like, so here I'm thinking of my data as living on the surface of this pair of pants, and the function I've drawn is just the height function. So points just sort of map over to that little real line segment there. Now, summaries, when I say respect to a function, that's because there are different ways. There's no one unique summary of data, right? There's no, just like if you were summarizing a play, a Shakespeare play, there's no one summary of the play. There's a plot summary, maybe there's a summary of location, there's a timeline, right? These are all different kinds of summaries of a single complicated object. In the same way, I'm going to use different functions to generate different summaries of my data. Okay, so there's my data and there's my function. Now I'm going to build a summary. What I do is I'm going to take overlapping intervals in the range of the function. If you want, I'm going to take an open cover of the real line. Here I have two um, intervals, u1 and u2. And I'm going to look at the inverse image of each uh, interval in the data set. So that's that part below the dotted line on that pair of pants. And then I'm going to apply clustering to that inverse image, any clustering technique I like. So here I do that. And for every cluster I find, I'm going to draw a, a dot in my summary. So here I looked at that first inverse image of U1. I found two clusters. I drew two dots. So now I go up to U2. I'm going to do the same procedure, look at the inverse image of U2, take the clusters, and draw my dots. Now, you'll notice that since U1 and U2 are overlapping, their inverse image also has that band in the middle where there's some data points that are in both U1 and U2. That means there are some data points that go to some cluster in U1, and they go to some cluster in U2. So clusters share data points in common. When that happens, I'm going to draw an edge. So I do that. And now I just continue for the over the range of the function f. So this is what I get. This is a summary of the data. Why is it a summary? Well, it's remembered something about the data. It remembered that it had this y shape, right? But it forgot something else. It forgot that there was a hole in the middle, right? Summaries remember some things and forget others. The goal is going to be to understand our complex data by using different summaries to extract different pieces of information about the shape of the data. So here's a kind of sketch of this. So I had the Y shape with F. So I'm drawing that schematically just as a Y. If I use the function G and I did the same process of clustering the inverse image, I would find this eyeglass shape, right? So there are two aspects of the pair of pants. There's the Y shape and there's the legs, right? And by using different lenses, I get, different, I get access to those pieces of information independently. Now, something to keep in mind is that 
I've drawn this out as something you can see and something that you can visualize um, so that you can see that I'm summarizing something about the data. In reality, of course, we never have access to seeing the pair of pants. You'll just have access to some kind of summary of what the data looks like. They're not projections, right? Because I've done something in the inverse image. And in fact, um, the procedure is entirely combinatorial. So the summary doesn't come with coordinates. So it's not really dimensionality reduction at all. It's transferring uh, a metric space. So you start with something that's a metric space, and you've turned it into a combinatorial object. Um, nodes, edges. Uh, the procedure actually has, so there's like an aspect I'm not talking about, there are faces and higher dimensional structures as well. So it's actually a simplicial complex, not a graph. It's an abstract simplicial complex, no coordinates, but th those are just sort of details that aren't particularly relevant right now. Okay, so where do you get these, sum these lenses from, these, these functions to create su summaries? Yes, are these interactive sessions? Shoot. <laughs> no, no, go, come on. I can't hear you. I was just about to talk about that. You're, you're jumping ahead. <laughs> functions, where do they come from? So you already have, right? Functions are just, for every data point, it's a real number. Um, so you already have lots of ways of producing functions. From statistics, you have things like, um, uh, you know, uh, uh, summary statistics, right? Mean, max. Uh, variance, uh, nth moments. If you have a density estimator, that's a function, right? The local density at a point. Um, functions also come from machine learning uh, and also from geometry. So the topology is a way of taking all these kind of disparate fields, statistics, machine learning, geometry, and kind of puts it into a single framework that creates summaries of the data. Now, I think the question was, well, how do you choose a summary? So some, how do you choose a function? Uh, some, some functions are kind of universally useful. In the same way that if you're summarizing a play, there are some summaries, like the plot summary, that unless it's a postmodernist play, is like always useful, right? So something like density, right? Knowing about how local density is in your data and using that as a summary function is always informative. Other, other, um, other summaries are going to depend on the situation. It is something you have to either have to think through or you have to apply or um, just try. Right? So there are some things that are universally informative and other functions you know, are custom designed to get at specific aspects of the data, specific aspects of the data shape. OK, so I'm advocating here for the use of, of, of topology. And, and in fact, it's not even apparent how I'm using topology. So, so you have to be sort of familiar with topology to sort of see um, why I'm even talking about topology right now. But I want to say, well, why topology? Like, it's, not, it's probably not part of the curriculum that you studied. If you studied data science or machine learning or statistics, um, but why is it natural for these kinds of questions? So there are three properties of topology that turn out to be really useful for machine learning and data science. So coordinate freeness, deformation and variance, and compressed representation. And I just want to talk about them each in turn, how they show up in problems, and give you a very simple example of how they manifest themselves. So the, the topology of a shape doesn't depend on the coordinates used to describe the shape. So that's, that's a, a fact for mathematics. And what that means, sort of a translation of that, is that different feature sets can be used. If I'm studying disease, right, I can do it by studying, say, uh, looking at gene expression levels, or I can use clinical information. I can take your temperature, measure your heart rate, or, or maybe I use blood tests, right? Those are all different ways of studying the same underlying thing, the disease, the state of the disease, the state of the disease in your body. These are just different coordinates on that same phenomena. The things that we care about never depend on the coordinates, right? We, we, we care about how sick you are, not on the coordinates I use to describe your sickness. Another, a very simple way of thinking about that 
is like in science, right? The temperature at which water boils is a certain temperature. If I give it to you in Celsius or Fahrenheit, it doesn't matter, right? It happens at a certain spot. You care about the, that chemical, you know, um, process and when it happens, not the particular coordinates used to describe it. The real world is the same way. We actually don't care about the coordinates. We care about some other phenomena. So topology is kind of built around this concept of coordinate freeness. So here's an example of coordinate freeness in, in action. These are two different uh, populations of people with breast cancer. And um, they're, they're measuring, uh, measuring the, the gene expression levels uh, for, these, for these patients with breast cancer. Uh, there's the NKI study, it's Nether Cancer Institute and uh, GSE 230, I don't remember where that's from. But the point is that the population was different, right? So it's different people, they measured different genes using different machines, different technology. But the summary of the shape is the same, right? It doesn't matter how I've studied the people, that summary, that sort of disease space that I'm, I'm, I'm mapping out with my different coordinate systems ends up being the same. What is that? Uh, yeah, so the colors actually, uh, in this case, they represent, um, 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 do, 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 uh, ESR, ESR1 um, levels. Anyway, I'm not a biologist. I'm not trying to do a biology talk. You're supposed to just see that they're both Ys. That's, that's like the point here. <laughs> Um, so here's another, and, and I happen to have a, a bunch of ones from, from biology here. So, so the point here you're supposed to look at is, so these are uh, malaria in, in human and in mice. And uh, they're, the, the real, so one, they're all circles, which is interesting, uh, which is a good story, which, which I should tell. But the, the point in this portion of the talk is that there's clinical data, malaria, the second from the from the right, and then there's also um, for humans, and then there's also another human one. Oh, and the second from the left, which is gene expression information, right? So this is clinical data. So it's like uh, your temperature, the your blood pressure, right? Things like that. Uh, it's relatively low dimensional, and the second one is very high dimensional, thousands of dimensions, gene expression data, and we see the same shapes. Right? We're both, they're studying malaria in the same way. So I have a little digression on, on this that, that I'm going to get a little bit away from coordinate invariance, but it goes back to the fact that we don't know what the possible shapes are. So the, the way I described it earlier, each node represents a collection of points from the data, right? Because it's a cluster. So a node is a cluster. Um, so, so this is actually from, this is from uh, research from uh, David Schneider. He's in the Stanford Medical School. And um, it, it, what it goes back to is hospitals, when you get admitted to a hospital, they want to know how, how sick you are. And so they build predictive models where they would measure a bunch of stuff, and then they would say, oh, this person is just a little bit sick with malaria, or this person's very sick with malaria. And the way they did that was just with a regression model. Right? And, and they used them, and the regression models, like, they weren't great, right? But people thought, oh, you know, it's biology, it's messy, you know, who, who knows, right? It's probably that. Um, now, if you think about how you actually get sick and get healthy, you, you don't have some symptoms and then kind of track up and then track back down through those same sy symptoms, right? How you get better is very different. There's a, there's a curve. You pass through different sets of symptoms as you get sick and then healthy again, right? Which is that very naturally, disease states should have been modeled as circles, but nobody thought to look for circles. They were modeling it as regression lines. So even in this relatively simple situation of circles versus lines, for 50 years, we've been doing it wrong, Right? And so David Schneider is in the process of, of publishing this work and is going to change the way hospitals do disease prediction. And it was because he looked, he decided to say, hey, I wonder what the shape looks like. And these circles just pop out. He didn't model the circles. He didn't say, am I looking for circles? Well, he may have, he may have thought in the back of his mind, I bet these things aren't lines. But 
he, did, he wanted to see what was in the data. And, and so it's, it's also an example of that. But back to the three properties of topology for why you should consider it. So deformation invariance. This is that topology doesn't depend on how you stretch your data, how you kind of smoosh it around. Right? And what this, what this does is it means that, that, that it's kind of built in with noise resistance and you don't have to do as much pre-processing and you get more stable features. So this isn't that it's like a feature um, transform magic, right? It's not says you don't, it, it's, I'm not saying you don't have to do any feature transformations. But what I'm saying is that if you make some bad choices, the system is very resilient to still giving you the right answer. You don't have to be exactly right. And that's built into it from the topology. So uh, here's a very simple example of that is I have a line and a, a noisy line, and I'm going to use this system, I'm going to use as a function just the x coordinate to build a, a graph from these very low dimensional uh, lines. So this is what I get. So it turns out that the left line that looked right like a very clean line was in fact a stretched out circle, right? So even even if I had looked at my data, like I'm a good data scientist, right? Plot your data. It's something we all know. I looked at it. Boy, it looks like a line, right? It turns out that it was a circle, not a line at all. And the other line was just a noisy line, and I didn't find structure there. So that's what I mean by robustness. Right? I had deformed the circle, I found it, even though I had deformed it, I added noise, I didn't go ahead and find a bunch of structure in the noise. Right? That's what I mean by deformation uh, invariance. Here's another example, same idea, I'm going to use the x-coordinate as a lens. These are two lines that have been kind of twisted up around each other, right? they've been deformed, and when I look at them, I'm going to see just the two lines. I'm not going to, I don't record the embedding, that, twisting around each other, I just re record the shape itself. Okay, and the final one was compressed representation. So this is something I me mentioned already, is that we're replacing a metric space and sort of that complexity with a combinatorial summary. Uh, combinatorial summaries are um, sort of easier to manage. Um, there, there, there are lots of tools that you can use to analyze them. And um, they're going to maintain the essential features, right? The example of that Y in the graph, we, we had the Y shape, right? The, the pants had the Y, and the graph had the Y. So that combinatorial summary maintains essential features of the data. And so what are some other compressed representations you use? Well, maps, right? If I'm going to travel from San Francisco to Seattle, I don't want to have to go out there with my like measuring stick and figure out from scratch how to get between the two cities, right? I'm going to use a compressed representation, a map, in order to do that. And that's the, exactly the idea behind these topological summaries, is to use them as ways to very rapidly make good decisions about your data. Okay, so there's another baby example. I'm going to show you now some, some actual data um, that I looked at. So this here is uh, insurance claim data. It's a sparse data set, so it's uh, counts of, um, of procedure and diagnosis codes for uh, providers. And what we're looking for is uh, fraud, uh, uh, claims fraud on the part of the providers. So here, it's hard to tell. There's lots of little nodes here. Each node consists of a collection of providers. And I'm coloring now by the average claim value that those providers have. So you can see there are some groups of providers that have very high average claim values, right? The, this group down here that's in red. And then there's like some sparser, smaller groups, these kind of web-like red structures. And then there are people, you know, somewhere in between as well. Now, when I'm looking for fraud, so, so what the, the, this... Um, this insurance company did is they created an ensemble of like anomaly prediction models and they were um, the idea is that the, the different models in the ensemble are independent and um, they want to just use those to find cost outliers. So what I'm going to do now is, co is color by the percentage in each node of providers that were flagged by the anomaly model. So 
I get this, this group here at the bottom. So if you, I'll just go back and forth. Here's cost. Here's anomalies. This group sort of consistently was being flagged by this fraud outlier model, right? So you could hope that this is, um, you could hope maybe that, oh, that there's kind of a model-free way of finding fraud, right? If you're in that group, you're fraudulent. What actually um, we figured out had happened was that there's a model bias. So the way they did their anomaly detection had an implicit bias in it that was always going to flag these providers. And it had gone unnoticed by the uh, modelers at the insurance company, and yet it kind of just jumps out when you look at a map or how this kind of information lays on top of a geometric summary, topological summary of your data. So here's another example, um, predictive maintenance for turbines. Maybe I'll skip over that. So here's, here's a nice example. This is customer churn data from a, a major US uh, telephone company. So it's divided up here by contract stage. So you have the very early people in the early stages on the far right, and people in the later stages are on the left. Uh, one thing to notice is that you kind of get the same shape is repeated uh, seven times. So it's repeated not exactly, but almost, right? So there's like sometimes that top piece on the left is glued on, right? And sometimes it's free. But if you look, the, the basic shape, all these flares are the same. So that says that the, the population that I'm seeing in the, um, in the different contract stages is, is filling out the same shape in space. I see that shape, shape repeated. It's well sampled, right? Each of the stages is well sampling the space of possibilities. And also, I'll just point out, some of these flares are actually quite small. So they have on the order of hundreds of people in them, and yet we see them repeated through the different stages. This is now colored by um, propensity to leave. And the thing to notice here is that if you leave at the beginning of your, contract state, uh, your phone contract, there's a well-defined reason for leaving. And the way you see that is that the people who leave are in two separate regions. And if you're not in those two regions, you're not going to leave um, you're not going to cancel your contract. On the other hand, at the end of your contract stage, right, it's scattered all over the place. You know immediately that there's a diversity of reasons for why people leave their contracts. Okay, thanks.